welcome back to The Winning Agenda. My name is Jesse Muleman Marshall, and we're here with some coverage from yesterday's Sorcery pre-release launch event at Plenty of Games here in Melbourne, Australia. I thought this was a great chance to showcase what it's actually like playing Sealed Sorcery Alpha in real life. Um, so I've tried to capture as best as I can from the in-store game day whilst I was judging and doing a thousand other things. I uh, tried to capture a bit, of a, a bit of gameplay footage to show you what sorcery is like to play in person. And then I thought I'd give you my thoughts and my commentary on the game as we go through. So you might have caught there at the start, uh, we mulliganed away a spin attack and a pit vipers and we've drawn into a Highland Clansman and a Petrosian Cavalry. This deck, I will actually post a, I recorded my deck construction and my booster pack opening, so I'll be posting that in a couple of days. You'll be able to check that out as well. Uh, so we'll go through what's in the deck and why, uh, but for now we're just gonna talk through this particular game. So it's an air, earth, and fire deck. It's actually really fire, earth, splashing air just for Highland Clansmen in the end. Uh, I felt that my fire earth pool just didn't have enough high power minions to reliably close out games. And I was worried that I might actually get decked out and not have enough uh, minions left to actually finish off opponents. So I wanted to play the clansmen because they're both such great finishers to get people to death store. Uh, but they're also just five power minions, which is something I didn't have anything of, I don't think in earth or fire. So we got the clansmen in there, even though as I'll talk about in the uh, deck construction video, it was a bit of an awkward call to actually put the clansmen in when you're playing sorcerer because you don't always want to be going up to seven mana. You sort of want to be using your sorcerer's ability to draw two cards a turn as soon as possible. So we mulliganed away pit vipers and you might think why would you want to mulligan away a one cost one power minion? Well the answer is that I actually don't want pit vipers on turn one. I'd rather, particularly since I had a village in hand, actually be getting my village mana turn, uh, my village foot soldier turn one rather than playing a pit vipers. Uh, but in the end, I decided here to play the uh, Ruins. I'm not 100% sure why, <laughs> in retrospect. I think the Village probably was the right play there. Um, the only thing I can think of... Now, that, that play really doesn't make sense. That, that should be the Village back there. But in the end, it did end up hurting me. Uh, because if I draw a 2-drop now, it's I've wasted that mana on turn 1, and it's just not a mana-efficient play. If I'd actually played that Village and summoned the Foot Soldier on my home site, uh, then I would have a Foot Soldier there to block the Spectral Stalker. I ended up drawing a Leap Attack, so I didn't really get punished for it, because I didn't have a 2-drop. So anyway, uh, enough about criticizing my own plays. What we've got here is a... So we've got Tapped the Sorcerer, played the Ruins turn 1. Our opponents played uh, Autumn River and then a updraft ridge. They've then played a spectral stalker. So we're under a little bit of pressure early, but that foot soldier can tap to block, uh, sorry, tap to defend on our first site where the sorcerer is if the spectral stalker comes in there to attack. We also had the option here of actually avoiding the middle site. So we could have just played the foot soldier underneath the spectral stalker and brought it out of the void. Uh, but I don't think that that really achieved anything for us if, for instance, we'd had free city in hand, which we do have in the deck, then it would have been great to just play that underneath the Spectral Stalker and kill it straight away. Um, but as it is, we opted to take the middle site. And often when you're playing Sorcery for newer players, those middle sites are quite important because meeting your opponent's sites is kind of like moving your pawns out in chess. It stops your opponent coming too far into your territory. So you'll often see that as the opening moves from both players to just block off that path straight across and reserve the space in behind that middle site there for you to play your sites. Because otherwise, if you get too choked and your opponent's pressing in their sites on your side of the board, you can actually find it hard to develop your mana um, in the way that you want. And you can actually get yourself locked out uh, in the later game of getting up to as much mana as you might want. So our opponent here is uh, has played a Coral Reef Kelpie. They've attacked in with the Spectral Stalker and we've defended with the Foot Soldier. We've got a Leap Attack, Petrosian Cavalry, Torsum a Trinket, Highland Clansman, and that Spear of Destiny hiding there in hand, which is a bit of a trump card, particularly in Sealed. It's a very high power piece of removal. There aren't many pieces of removal in Alpha that can remove any minion in any region on the board, but Spear of Destiny is one of them. So we've got that trump card sitting in our hand. And we've also got Fire, Air, and Earth Threshold now, so we can pretty much play every spell in our deck from a Threshold perspective. We've also got the tower here, which gets us up to four mana. So we get to play the Petrosian Cavalry. Now, with the Taurus Hammer Trinket in hand, what I was thinking with this play is I can play the Petrosian Cavalry because it's got charge, which is like haste. I can attack the Spectral Stalker that's on my uh, home site straight away. 
get rid of that. And then if the opponent attacks him with their Coral Reef Kelpie onto my Rustic Village, I can actually, on my turn, equip the Taurus Hammer Trinket onto the Petrosian Cavalry, make it four power, so that when it fights the Coral Reef Kelpie, it will kill the Coral Reef Kelpie, but it won't die itself. Whereas if there were three power minions fighting each other, they would both die. So I'm really hoping here on this turn that my opponent comes in with the Coral Reef Kelpie onto that Rustic Village, and then I can execute the Taurus Hammer Trinket on the Petrosian Cavalry to finish it off next turn and keep my Cavalry in play. And I think at this point, if I can do that with the quality of the cards that I've got in my hand, like I've got a Leap Attack that I can then use on my Petrosian Cavalry the following turn to hopefully get some more value. I've got a Violimp to remove something small. I've got the Spear of Destiny that can remove anything. And then a Highland Clansman as that sort of top end of my curve. It gives me, you know, some pretty good options for continuing to develop my board. And I'm asking a lot of my opponent there. So the opponent comes out with a Apprentice Wizard. And I should say that my opponent in this match was also named Jesse. So it was the Jesse Mirror match, the Jesse Grudge match. And Jesse O, who I was playing against in this match, ended up walking away with one of the champion cards. We did those as a random draw because this was sort of a casual sealed pre-release event. We didn't watch, want too much pressure to be on the games, so we gave out two of them as random draws and the other Jesse was luck enough to, lucky enough to walk away with one of them. So the Apprentice Wizard is something that I'm not too worried about because I'll be able to just pick it off with the Violin next turn. And the Coral Reef Kelpie has come in onto the site where we wanted it to be, and that means we can pick it off with the Petrosian Cavalry using the Taurus Hammer Trinket. So a free city comes down. I'm just trying to arrange everything nicely for the camera with the life total in there and everything as well. It all got a bit a bit congested, but it's looking all right. So it's come out all right. Um, so we've got this Taurus Hammer Trinket onto the cavalry, which can then take out the Kelpie. And then we've got the Vile Imp that can come down and take out the Apprentice Wizard. So there goes the Trinket onto the cavalry. The cavalry is going to come in as a four power take out the Kelpie. The Apprentice Wizard, because it's played onto that side site, can't join in the fight because it's too far away for it to join in the defense. And really, even if my opponent had played it onto that middle site, the Updraft Ridge, I could have just played the Violent first. So down comes the Violent, takes out the Apprentice Wizard. And then other Jesse on the other side of the table untaps and the Taurus Hammer Trinket goes back to hand. So I should say as well, we're playing with the erratas and the FAQs. So Taurus Hammer Trinket, although it's printed, as it's printed, it says at the end of your turn, return this to your hand. Um, what that would mean is that it would return to hand before damage wore off. So my Petrosian Cavalry would actually die there. But the errata that's been issued in the league FAQ is that the intention of Taurus Hammer Trinket was that that doesn't happen. Otherwise it would be a pretty <laughs> terrible card. Uh, and the actual intention is that it's supposed to bounce back to your hand after damage is worn off. So the errata is that it bounces back at the start of your opponent's turn rather than at the end of your turn to achieve that intended outcome. So the opponent goes up to five sites in play here with another Autumn River. They have a look at the top card of their spell book. And they've drawn a Chain Lightning. So we're just having, I think, a conversation here about Chain Lightning, the Sorcerer needs to be nearby, but because they have already played the Autumn River by tapping the Sorcerer, they can't actually move the Sorcerer up. So unfortunately, Chain Lightning not able to hit the Violin for this turn, and we're gonna forget we ever saw that. <laughs> so that's one of the one of the things that was really great about this particular event was everybody was learning the game. So uh, I was participating, but also throughout this game, I had a hundred people coming up and asking me questions uh, from all over the tournament, which was great and all of my opponents were very patient with that throughout the day. Um, and it was just a great opportunity for me to show through playing, like, you know, teaching things like this throughout the games I was playing in my rounds, but also to give everybody else the answers that they needed as they were playing through their games. And watching people develop and explore the game throughout the various rounds, I think we played four rounds yesterday, it was just amazing to watch, even in that short span of time, in round one, I had questions about every little thing. By the end of round four, people were playing through basically full games without really needing to ask me many questions. And they were really coming to grips with what their cards did and, and the sorts of interactions that commonly came up. So that was great. It was great to see people learning so quickly, uh, but it was also great to see all the smiles and how much people were enjoying the various interactions. You know, there's so many moments in a game of sorcery 
like this one here, the opponent's thinking about how do I cast this Ice Lance to make it as impactful as possible? And I'm just talking him through, you can start the projectile. So Ice Lance launches a projectile. It deals three, two, then one damage on the three different sites. It pierces through different units. So it can hit three things. You can choose to start a projectile on the site you're on or the next site. So I'm just explaining to Jesse that he can start the three damage on the site his sorcerer is on or on the updraft ridge and then it will be two damage on the following site and then one damage on the site after. So at the moment, it's probably not optimal for him to play it because he'd be dealing three damage on the updraft ridge, nothing's there, two damage to my cavalry, which wouldn't kill it, and then just one damage to my sorcerer. So he's chosen, instead of playing the uh, ice lance to hold onto that for later and just play the swan maidens as a bit of a, a minion to defend perhaps and preserve the life total a little bit. So at the moment, Jesse's still sitting on 20 life. I'm sitting on 17. Took a bit of damage from that Coral Reef Kelpie hit early. But I'm feeling like with my cavalry surviving that turn, I might be able to establish a bit of board presence here. So we play out a village and that cute little quarter-sized foot soldier token. Those tokens did plenty of work uh, on the day. I had a few of them because I had one, from, uh, one set from some pre-cons. The store had a pre-con set as well. And then I had the ones from the pledge pack myself so I was able to share those with everybody um, on the day and people were actually able to use tokens, which is always nice. You know, you can use face down cards or whatever else to represent tokens, but it's nice to have the actual things themselves. And these tiny tokens work really well in the game. So I've played a leap attack and killed the Swan Maidens. So because the Swan Maidens is airborne, my Violimp couldn't actually attack it normally. Um, but by playing the leap attack, it allowed my Violimp to kill the Swan Maidens which then frees up my Petrosian Cavalry to get in for three, stops my opponent from blocking the three. And then my Violimp's actually untapped after the leap attack, so it can still attack itself. So I managed to get five damage in that turn and remove the Swan Maidens and create a Foot Soldier. So I was pretty happy with that turn uh, for turn five. Not a, not a bad outcome for five mana. And the thing that I was thinking here at this point was, look, I've got this Spear of Destiny in hand. I've already got enough mana to play that. So next turn, what I can do is draw a site, tap to play the site, have enough mana to play the Taurus Hammer Trinket if I need it, or if I just want to get in more damage. And then I can also play the Spear of Destiny on my foot soldiers, and on my foot soldier, I should say, and throw that at whatever minion my opponent plays. Um, of course, I was playing out the rest of this game, pretending I didn't know that my opponent had the Ice Lance and the, and the um, Chain Lightning. Because it would have been very rude in an intro game if I'd tried to dodge the Ice Lance by not moving my Petrosian Cavalry there after my opponent had asked me a question about it. So we went in there with the Ice Lance, uh, with the Petrosian Cavalry, I should say, and, and copped the Ice Lance right in the dome. Uh, so three to the Cavalry, two to the Village, and one to my Sorcerer. So a nice little Ice Lance there, getting a bit of value, the extra one to the Sorcerer, and removing the most powerful minion on my board. So definitely a good play. And then Jesse goes ahead and removes my Violimp as well. So definitely a good turn for Jesse there and not exactly what I wanted to see. So um, as I said, I was, I've was i got these two equipment in my hand, one of which is a piece of removal. So I wanted my opponent to play some big juicy minion for me to remove and for me to still have my board presence to keep the damage pressure on. Uh, two pieces of removal getting rid of both of my powerful minions was not what I wanted to see. So instead of drawing a site then this turn, what I've thought is, look, I actually want to develop my board here. So I've drawn into Shield Maidens and Blaze. So the other thing about drawing a site uh, that last turn, and this is what I was saying at the very start about the Highland Clansmen being a little bit awkward sometimes in Sorcerer, is that if I want to play Clansmen in two turns time, I need to keep drawing sites and playing out sites each turn. But I decided from a tempo perspective that drawing two spells this turn was probably better than, and delaying playing the Clansmen a turn was not too bad an opportunity cost for me to potentially get one or two minions out right now. And I think getting the Shield Maidens out here, they're not the most powerful attackers, you know, they're only two power, but getting another minion on the board is nice. And Blaze is another nice piece of removal as well. So sorry about the slightly, the slight knocks on the camera there. I was, as I said, trying to answer questions. I had people coming up all over the place and I'm trying to keep all the cards in focus and keep everything going on in the game. So that was a, this was a high mental load moment for me. <laughs> so at this point we're sort of 
you know, we've got powerful cards in hand for sure. We're thinking, oh, we've got a bit of removal. It's going to be hard for our opponent to stick much. But then our opponent plays something like Deep Sea Mermaids, which is a nice blocker. It, it gets some presence on the board and it's not really worth us spending a, a card on to remove because we've kind of got all this premium sort of high value removal like Spear of Destiny and even Blaze, which is not something that you'd want to waste just getting rid of Deep Sea Mermaid, which has drawn another card. Swamp Buffalo, on the other hand, you know, that's actually a full card in and of itself. It's only two power, so we might well see Foot Soldier taking a bit of a blazing run this turn to kill the Swamp Buffalo. So our opponent spent four mana, and I think they've got two left, but not enough mana to obviously play that last card in their hand. So they're just passing the turn. So we did draw a sight this turn, looking to develop and get towards that Highland Clansman in a couple of turns time. And a village is always a nice one to get. And I think this is something if you're playing sealed uh, to keep in mind is that the the basic sites actually drive a lot of gameplay and they, they are really powerful. You know, the towers being able to ramp your mana, the deserts being able to remove one power minions makes one power minions a lot worse. And the foot soldiers just being effectively free off your villages is pretty good. But then of course, as I said, you've got the deserts to counter them. So if you are playing an earth deck and you're not playing against deserts, you're always pretty happy because you're gonna get a bit of value off those foot soldiers. And even here you can see the value of just having that extra body to attach my Taurus Hammer Trinket to gives me just that bit more um, flex, gives me just that bit more flexibility. And so I'm able to attack for two with the foot soldier, get rid of the swamp buffalo with the blaze and then get in for another two with the shield maidens. And even though this damage is just small chip damage, it's not the biggest amounts. It's already got our opponent down from 20 to nine. And so now it's looking like we've got six sites in play, which means we can draw a site and then play the site next turn. And that will allow us to play the Highland Clansmen. And this is where you can see how, although the Clansmen are a bit awkward and it's forced us to draw a site last turn and play the site, which has an opportunity cost, like that's two spells we could have drawn last turn the power of the, that the Klansman gives us and the flexibility to be pretty sure we're gonna be able to chunk five damage off them, gives a lot more inevitability and a lot more closing power to the deck. So our opponent comes down with a Sea Serpent. Uh, unfortunately, it's gonna be waterbound, so it won't be able to defend that updraft ridge. So we just had a, ha a bit of a chat about waterbound and that it's probably better to play that sea serpent on the water so that it's not disabled because it can't really do much while it's on land. It can sit there and just not attack, not defend, <laughs> not so good. So we draw that site, we play out our seventh site. There is actually a little foot soldier as well, just slightly off camera there on that right hand village. And there's now another village off camera as well. So we've actually got seven sites. We attack for one with the foot soldier so we had a, a bit of confusion about whether the C7 can actually defend on the updraft ridge, uh, but we've resolved it all. The clansman's out and we figured out that our opponent's down to one. So they took five from the clansman, two from the shield maidens and one from the foot soldier and went down from nine to one. So a powerful turn for us there, that clansman really taking that chunk out of their life total. And even just looking at the damage that the foot soldier and the shield maidens have done over the last couple of turns, it really, like six damage between the two of them is quite a lot. Like that's quite a lot for these tiny minions to have done. So our opponent now has to kind of go into chump block mode. Uh, they're worried that the foot soldier is gonna be able to get them down to death's door. Um, and again, this was another another thing that came up consistently yesterday was just remembering the death storm mechanic. So our opponent thought, well, I can't successfully defend against your three attackers, so I'm dead. And I think I was just reminding him at this point, well, you know, you're not 100% dead. I can I can get you to death storm next turn, but you still get the chance to come back if there's if you've got some removal in your deck that can clear my board. So he's tapped the sorcerer to draw an extra spell, and he's drawn a spectral stalker by the looks of things. But I think. He's got to count his mana because there's one, two, three, four, five, six, and he's already spent five. So he doesn't quite have enough mana to play out that Stalker. So that Deep Sea Mermaids on the right hand side, remember as well, is, is actually defending against a foot soldier that's on the village, slightly off camera. So that's the reason that it's staying over there untapped. And our opponent's just thinking through what happens if you attack here, what happens if you attack here, and wondering whether 
they might want to play the Spectral Stalker instead of one of the other minions, but I think it's much of a muchness at this point. So he's thinking about playing that, but if he does, he's going to have to take back one of the Phantom Steed or the Cloud Spirit. So he decides in the end to stick with the Cloud Spirit and the Phantom Steed. And then it's just all about, can we deal the death blow? So they've, our opponent's got the Sea Serpent defending the Sorcerer. So although the Sea Serpent hasn't been able to stop our opponent getting to Death's Door, it is going to be able to defend if we try and attack onto that site to finish the Sorcerer off, because remembering that the last damage actually has to be dealt to the Avatar directly. So this turn, we attack first with the Clansman. Our opponent's thinking about gang blocking or defending with both minions, but... I think at this point our opponent was mistaken that the Phantom Steed had three power, which I compl completely understand. There aren't all that many minions that are three cost and two power, and two of them happen to be on the board here, the Shield Maners and the Phantom Steed. So our opponent was thinking, I think, that if they defended with both, they might be able to remove the Clansmen from the board and just have the other two, to, the smaller minions to contend with next turn. But the other thing, of course, is that the Shield Maidens is protecting the Clansmen too. So the Highland Clansmen going to survive regardless, so our opponent just chump blocks with the Phantom Steed, and then the Shield Maidens is coming in, and our opponent's thinking, oh, do I want to just do what's going to be a chump block on the Shield Maidens because of the damage prevention? Because they know they're going to go to Death Store anyway. They can't defend because the Sorcerer is tapped, they can't defend with the Sea Serpent because it's waterbound, so they're just thinking through all their options. And I think they probably, they can't defend with the mermaids because it's too far away. So in the end, they just decide to chump block with the cloud spirit on the shield maidens. We play out the Taurus hammer trinket on the foot soldier and take out the deep sea mermaids. And then the other foot soldier comes in and gets our opponent down to death's door. So one damage down to zero. So now we've got this challenge of how do we deal the death blow and we're lucky enough that this turn we've actually drawn a heat ray. So we've got this heat ray sitting in hand, which is a piercing projectile that's going to do two damage to everything on the sites from our sorcerer in a cardinal direction. So if we shoot it towards the opposing sorcerer straight across the board, we can deal two damage to one unit at each site, which includes avatars. And that means that heat ray is pretty much going to finish the game for sure from here. There's not really much our opponent can do to protect themselves from the heat ray at this point, save like a, a tragedy worry wart on their home site to protect themselves from magic damage and then another blocker. That would probably be the only out I can think of. Tragedy worry warts are a minion that prevents magic damage to nearby allies. But instead, our opponent is doing the absolute right thing, which is loading up with blockers on that site, see if they can hold out for another turn. But thankfully for us, we've got the heat ray in hand, so we can just slam down the heat ray. Our opponent's forgotten to draw with their sorcerer, so they're playing out the extra surge crabs, figuring out where they want to put the surge crabs. At this point, we probably could have cut them short. I just said we've got the heat ray, but I think if you want to let people enjoy their cards, right? So our opponent's having to think about their surge crabs, figuring out how, how, well, how it all works, and they've decided to play it on the home site, and there goes that heat ray. So two damage, even if we do two damage to our shield maidens, we'll survive because of the damage prevention. And then all of that is moot because the opponent's at death's door and the heat ray will finish off the sorcerer, which we can pick out because we get to choose one unit at each location along the path. So there you go. That was one of the rounds from yesterday's sealed event at Plenty of Games in Melbourne. It was wonderful to finally be able to play a full event with real cards in hand and see so many players we had. We hit our cap of 16. We could only have 16 players because of the amount of product we've got because we've also got a bigger release event coming up on the 6th of August at Plenty of Games. So if you're in Melbourne, there's still a few tickets left for that. So come along if you can. Uh, but we hit our, our cap that we'd set of 16 for yesterday, which was astonishing because we only had about a week and a half's notice for the event. So that was an amazing turnout. It was a wonderful day. Thank you to everyone who came along. Thank you to Jesse who actually asked me to record this. Other Jesse uh, actually asked me to record this game. He said, you know, do you want to record our game? And I was like, yeah, why not? Um, we'll give it a go. So thanks to Jesse for being a great sport. 
Thanks to everyone who came along. Thanks to the Plenty of Games team. And thanks to all of you for watching. We hope you've enjoyed this coverage of a very special and very fun live event. We'll have more gameplay videos to come. As I said, I'm going to do uh, a quick rundown of my actual deck construction. So the deck that I played in this match. Uh, and then we'll have some more gameplay and uh, deck techs and deck showcases of some constructed decks coming up soon as well. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time. Cheers.